Now drone technology also undermines another of the traditionally understood features of the battlefield, the mutual risk of combatants. Indeed, remote targeting creates a radical asymmetry between drone operators and the individuals they target. Drone operators uh, pilot remotely their aircraft from air-conditioned booths in the United States mainland. Their targets uh, have rarely see the drone, which is normally flying at either greater altitudes or under cloud cover or above cloud cover, such that they very often will never see the drone that surveys them for days or um, see the drone before uh, it strikes them with a guided missile. As one drone pilot put it, the insurgent knows we're there. And when we're not there, he thinks we might be there. It's kind of like having God overhead and lightning comes down in the form of a Hellfire missile. So drone warfare is very much experienced as an omniscient God's eye, holding a target in a state of total vulnerability. One could hardly think of a more radical form of asymmetry between a drone operator and target. And some, of course, have suggested that this kind of warfare is a form of video game war, one that distances operators from their actions. They're simply watching screens, targeting pixels uh, at a great remove. Well, while that account of video game warfare might be tempted, it is also probably too simplistic. It is important or noteworthy that very high stress levels have been reported among UAV pilots. Uh, a number of psychological problems uh, have been uh, also reported. And when we think about what, the, how, what being a drone operator might be like today, we should be mindful of the fact that drone pilots have to survey their targets through high definition video for long periods of time and often are expected to survey the aftermath of strikes. So one should also consider the technologically mediated forms of intimacy that are generated by the drone apparatus. One drone operator contrasts with the operation of drones with their prior experience as a pilot. I quote, I used to fly my own air missions. I dropped bombs, hit my target load, but I had no idea who I hit. Here I can look at their faces. I watch them for hours, see these guys playing with their kids and wives. When I get them alone, I have no compunction about blowing them to bits, but I wouldn't touch them with the civilians around. After the strike, I see the bodies being carried out of the house. I see the women weeping and in positions of mourning. That's not PlayStation, that's real. My job is to watch after the strike too. I count the bodies and watch the funerals. So here, there's a very useful contrast that's, that's being underlined here between conventional area operations, which have been conducted at uh, great distances and in which the consequences of bombing are rarely witnessed by the pilots or by the crews, whereas drone operators see in great detail their targets and what occurs when they strike them. So the characterization of drone warfare as video game warfare, or at least as video game warfare that implies emotional distance, I think is quite misleading. And indeed, perhaps we should take the metaphor of video game warfare or the parallel of video game warfare more seriously, because after all, many of video games are emotionally involving. Whatever one makes of the personal experience of drone operators, the attraction of drones to casualty averse militaries is obvious. Uh, we hear we could reference discussions we've had before about so-called riskless war or risk transfer war. The drone appears as an ideal weapon system uh, permitting the projection of power without vulnerability, as the US Air Force likes to say it. Or as one badge for a 
US Air Force Reaper team states, others so that others may die. I mean, war traditionally, again, entails killing and being killed. It entails the reciprocal exposure of combatants to the risk of death. And the, from this perspective, the ra radical asymmetry established by drone operations must evidently jar with any kind of warrior ethos that sees merit in exposure to danger and honor in adversaries putting their lives on the line in a trial of skill and courage. Remote targeting is not a new phenomenon. We've discussed already the increasing range of weaponry across the last hundred years or so. For a long time, it's been possible to target uh, enemies at great distances. But the telepresence enabled by remote control brings this out in sharper contrast. The targeters can see in great detail their targets, and yet their targets cannot see them and certainly cannot strike uh, against them. We can see the kind of malaise that um, this establishes for conventional military ethics uh, in reference to a controversy that uh, erupted over the Department of Defense announcement of a medal for drone operators. The Pentagon decided that it would create a medal uh, that would be among the highest ranking medals uh, analogous to ones awarded for great bravery and acts of courage in war. And there was great unhappiness within the US military about this uh, from quarters that objected that drone operators simply should not be awarded this kind of honor because they simply they took none of the risks that other equivalent medal holders had taken. So even within the US military, there's a recognition that uh, the actions of drone operators uh, jar with a certain understanding, perhaps a somewhat romanticized and antiquated understanding, but nonetheless a significant one, that engaging in war involves a form of risk, a form of exposure to the possibility that you might be killed. Some commentators, among which Gregor Shamayu, Suggest therefore that drone operators are no longer even intelligible as war. We no longer have a duel, as Clausewitz described war, but rather a hunt, in which the target is no longer an enemy, but merely a prey to be hunted down across the globe. So the duel again involved a, a certain symmetry, uh, adversaries fighting one another on. Uh, an equal, on an unequal basis. The hunt, of course, is completely asymmetric. The prey will not hunt the hunter, or at least very rarely. And so one would have to think about whether the prism of the hunt, the shift of military operations into the domain of the hunt, is tantamount to a form of dehumanization of the enemy. The enemy is being animalized, in a sense, uh, as a prey to be hunted, not as a political equivalent. And this, of course, is um, tied into the fact that these conflicts no longer are recognized as legitimate political disputes, no longer as a result of a struggle between uh, political adversaries, but rather from the point of view of the counter-terrorism campaigns uh, an exercise to eliminate a threat to, in some of the language used in counterterrorism, to mow the grass, to periodically uh, eliminate uh, a pest or threat. So far we've been talking essentially about the use of drones by the United States, which is the manifestation of drones which has drawn the most attention. But the reality, of course, is that drones are and have proliferated considerably. Around 100 countries have drones in their military arsenal today, about 40 of which are armed. Uh, as anyone that followed some of the news about the recent war between Azerbaijan and Armenia, we saw that the uh, 
former government or state military made a highly effective use of drones in its victory. Um, and this is exemplifying the ways in which drones are increasingly playing a, a role within, con within armed conflicts. Not necessarily through the individualized targeting uh, that we've seen in the context of, of the United States, although they can certainly be put to that use, but more generally as a, a very effective weapon platform. And development in drone technology is ongoing at great pace, including for micro drones and other forms of robotics technology. Uh, we have the opportunity to talk about more of that next week. Non-state actors have also been getting in on the act. Uh, ISIS reportedly flew through 300 drone missions in one month during the Battle of Mosul in 2017 and was able to do so using commercial drones costing around $650. A third of the drone mission, missions that were flown were armed strikes, dropping uh, grenades from these uh, drone aircraft. Uh, all very artisanal uh, conversions of drones, but already an early indication of what non-state actors might be able to do with drones. It is almost certainly a mere matter of time before a drone is used in a high profile terrorist attack in the developed world. Since ISIS pioneered uh, the non-state uh, use of drones, nine different armed groups are reported to have used drones from uh, areas such as Nigeria and Saudi Arabia to Venezuela and the Philippines. One would also have to question this impunity of drone strikes, that's to say this, this radical asymmetry, this, the fact that uh, drones appeared to allow the projection of force without vulnerability. One might query how long that can last. Uh, how long will it be bef bef before uh, drone pilots in the United States are attacked on US soil as retaliation for their role in uh, drone operations? We already know that these operators are aware of these risks and, and correspondingly keep a very low profile. More generally, General Stanley McChrystal uh, gets to the nub of this issue by pointing out that drone strikes are not a consequence-free use of force by the United States. To the United States, McChrystal says, a drone strike seems to have very little risk and very little pain. At the receiving end, it feels like war. Americans have got to understand that. If we were to use our technological capabilities carelessly, then we should not be upset when someone responds with their equivalent, which is a suicide bomb in Central Park, because that's what they can respond with. And I think this is a very important point here, which is the dissolution of the battlefield, the blurring of the boundaries of war, the spaces of war, the targets that are legitimate within war is very much a two-way process. Of course, in some ways, this process of targeted killing in the context of the war on terror was itself a response to a terrorist attack in 9-11 that targeted civilians very explicitly on US soil. But of course, targeted killings and the shifting norms of war that it is participating in shifting, driving, will have the, have the potential to rebound on the United States and other developed countries. And as we depart increasingly from established norms of war, we open up the possibility, the likelihood even, that war will become a much more amorphous phenomenon, one that can strike anywhere in the world at any moment. Uh, where there will no longer be definite spaces and temporalities of war, but a much more diffuse condition with various peaks of intensity uh, as part of it. And of course, drones may be part of that. Drones deployed by militaries and drones deployed by other actors. So the new geography of war that we have entered is one that potentially makes our daily existence a much more 
insecure and precarious one.